so so we saw DPLL last time, um, and if you try and go back in time to the early 60s, it was crap. I, it says here it was extremely effective, but in 1962 it was crap, and it certainly wasn't doing what people wanted it to do. Um, so in particular, they wanted to handle quantifiers, and they couldn't get anything. I mean, what they had was just kind of, I've got a for all x, oh, I'll just put in a 3. Why would you put in a 3? Well, maybe there's a 3 elsewhere in the problem, so you think maybe 3 will work. And that's not so easy if you've got like functions of two arguments, so that you're going to um, guessing all these combinations. Um, so back in the 60s, this invention of unification was a dramatic way of getting the, the terms that you wanted in a systematic way rather than just by guessing. Now the funny thing is, so, so unification leads to proper resolution, which we're going to see in a moment. Going back to the current day, when we now have DPLL that's very effective, now suddenly um, there are certain applications where DPLL greatly outperforms resolution, and then they actually have to go back to guessing, because when you can handle 10 million clauses, it's worth it to guess. Do you want me to try and switch off that wretched thing? I'm not sure how, but I will try. If the roof falls in, don't blame me. Unblank, which one is west? Is this one is west? No, this one is east. This one is east. Um, blank, east. Okay. So, our project and as I said, okay, last time we saw a baby look at resolution, but as I said, that isn't really resolution because the proper resolution is for first order logic. And the way it was to work, this is a general thing you see uh, in the treatment of first order logic, is getting rid of the complicated stuff in first order logic and trying to somehow reduce it to propositional logic again. That's what all of these guys were trying to do. Um, and this is what gives us ultimately the, the kind of proper resolution procedure which we will see next time. So the idea is you start with a first order problem and we're going to go through a series of stages. I guess we're Comskys, right? So you can think of like compilation goes through all these things like abstract syntax and internal representations and various forms until finally you get down to machine code. So it's this kind of layered trans systematic series of transformations until you turn one thing into something you can work with. So you will remember negation normal form is where you take a formula in the full language of first order logic and simplify it down. I don't think I mentioned negation normal form for quantifiers, maybe I did, but for that you just have to push your negations through any quantifiers until they're just applied to atoms. Now this is a simpler language than full first order logic. Um, the next step is a thing called scolarization, which we'll cover in a moment. Um, this gets rid of all the quantifiers. Now. Um, while preserving the, the question of whether the set of clauses is satisfiable or not, whether the, the formula is satisfiable or not. Now here, and this we will delve into this as well in this lecture, we consider these special models called Herbrand models. Now, remember what satisfiability means. Satisfiability means, is there a model? There are a lot of the models out there, so if we say there's a special kind of models called Herbrand models, we're able to greatly restrict the nature of the models we have to consider. In fact, these will turn out to be completely syntactic models. 
um, we will briefly look at a thing called Herbrand's theorem. And the point here is that if there is a contradiction in the original negated formula, it will have a finite form. That, that is what Herbrand was able to prove. That's what all the excitement was about when he did his PhD. Um, now, it was Robinson who invented this thing called the unification, which I also have to try and pack into this lecture. And all of this stuff put together gives us the proper resolution method. So that is, if you like, an outline of this lecture. So what is scolemization? Well, first of all, scolem was a Norwegian. Now, long ago, the, the Norwegians used to come here to burn monasteries and rape and pillage and all of that, but they stopped doing that. And they started doing nice things in logic, and we're very grateful for that. So what you do with scolemization, imagine you have already now remember, the very first thing you do is negate the thing you're trying to prove, right? We're proving things by contradiction. Okay, you've negated your formula. You've converted it to negation normal form, meaning you've pushed all those not symbols way inside. And now you've got a formula which you can write like this. Um, I mentioned a while back that we sometimes would like to pull the quantifiers out to the front. The reason for that is just so you don't have to write this ugly thing here with them nested inside. The trouble is, though, if you pull them out to the front, you're making the problem a lot harder. And you are all Komsky, so I assume you can cope with the notion of nested scopes, right? So these are nested scopes. You have a for all, no quantifiers with the three dots. Then there's another for all, another for all, and so on. And this is the very first exists. So what I'm trying to show you here is an existential quantifier. It is the outermost existential quantifier there is, surrounded possibly by universal quantifiers. And any other quantifiers are buried deeper inside, and we'll deal with them later. Now, scolemization is the idea is if for all x1, for all x2, for all xk, there exists y. That's kind of like saying there's a function. There's a k argument function, and we're just going to replace y by this new function. Of course, it has to be a new function. You can't call it a sine or something. Now, why the hell would this be true of the sine function? So a brand new function symbol, give it the, all, that correct number of arguments, which is exactly the number of things that are in, in the scope at that, at that point. And then you replace y everywhere uh, in the scope or where you had y's replace them by this function application. Now, when you have done such a step, you've eliminated one existential quantifier. And then you just keep doing that. Of course, the formula is finite. So this is a finite operation that eliminates all the existential quantifiers. Now, maybe, maybe you're thinking, this can't be right. Whatever. Um, <laughs> so this is now is the full example of a full process of conversion to clauses, which I think if I were brave enough to, visual, to visualize as I would do this myself. However, the, we have a lot to cover. And I don't want to get into a tangle. So th if you want to prove this, and remember, I think we, uh, we didn't see this before. We saw a slightly different formula before. This turns out is a theorem, though it may not look like one to you. Or, or we did see it before. I can't remember. Um, we'll have to negate it. Then, of course, we'll have to push the quantifiers in, convert to negation normal form. So you see that exist became for all. And as usual, the negation of the implies turned to the same formula there, ended with the negation of the conclusion. So we have this in negation normal form. Now, if you convert this directly into so this is negation normal form. 
Um, so that's the for all. That's the there exists. So we can put in a function there like that. And that's an example of scolarization. And then finally, the final clauses we get in the end are these. And by the way, and people keep getting confused here, this says for all x, px, and not p of f of x. And when we finally, uh, the final step we're allowed to do is throw away the universal quantifiers as well. So we now have quantifier-free clauses here. The variables in these clauses are implicitly universally quantified. Uh, that means there is no link between this x and that x. They're separate. They have separate scopes. And that means this clause says p is true for all values. That clause says p is false for all values of the form f of x. Now, I hope you can see these are contradictory. So, in fact, this is also contradictory, which means that is a theorem. Um, and I should mention, I probably will mention somewhere, if we were to reduce the scope of the quantifier here, because x is not present now in the second part, we would in fact get a constant rather than a function, and that would be even better. Now, I want to say briefly, why is scolarization okay? In other words, saying for all x exists y is just f of x, that's kind of naive, isn't it? Well, the reasoning goes as follows. So let's suppose this formula is satisfiable. What does it mean for it to be satisfiable? It means we have a model um, in which this thing evaluates to true. You will remember that horrible, I think it was lecture four with Tarski and all that. And in particular, then, it means that for every y, sorry, for every x, there indeed exists a y, making this true. That's what the model says. For every x, there, uh, this y exists. And indeed, um, the, the, sorry, this is the interpretation in which that is true. And that gives us a function. Now, why have I got the little hat there? It's because f, remember, with syntax versus semantics, f is the name of the function. f hat is the actual mathematical entity, which is a function which, as you recall from discrete math, is a set of pairs, blah, blah, blah. So f hat is the actual mathematical function mapping our domain D into itself. And therefore, if such a mathematical function exists, then we can create a model for this extended language in which we have introduced the symbol f. Remember, f was not there before. f was not a part of our language. Um, and then the formula will hold with this uh, f in it. So I think I've mentioned a couple of times, in closed methods, our transformations do not have to preserve meaning um, only satisfiability. And we've not preserved meaning because we've actually changed our vocabulary. We've introduced a new symbol. So we've, clearly we're not preserving the meaning of the formulas. But it is enough to preserve the property that this is satisfiable if and only if that is satisfiable. Because satisfiability is the only thing we are concerned with in resolution. Okay, so Sorry, it's about semantics. Right. Anyway. <laughs> oh.
Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly talk about Herbrand's theorem. Uh, if you looked at much earlier exam questions, like, I don't know, 10 years or go, so ago, you'll find more on this. So there was like a whole lecture on this before. I decided to be kind and cut out some of the stuff. But I wasn't going to eliminate it altogether because Sir Brand's theorem is the basis of the whole resolution thing. It's not the bait, well, it's not the basis of DPLL, incidentally, although it was what got people going in that direction. So, as I said, the question we're concerned with in proof by contradiction is the existence of models. <clears throat> that one model is enough to say it's satisfiable. However, there are so many, I mean, the number of models out there is ridiculous. So as I say, like if the states of the USA, you're not literally going to want these actual states like Wyoming and Idaho and Utah, because for any mathematical purpose, they are no different from the first 50 integers. Well, a lot of Americans would disagree with me here, but I mean, it's true. So how can we somehow systematically come up with a minimal set of models to be considered? Well, we're going to do it syntactically. And the trouble is here, um, and these syntactic models will have the property that there are enough of them. So the, the key thing is that they are mimics. I don't know if you've ever seen some of these very clever mimics on YouTube who can be, I don't know, they can do Angela Merkel in one episode and they can be Donald Trump in another one, or Boris Johnson. It's amazing how they do it. Well, we want models, syntactic models, that can mimic a genuine model so that any existing mathematical model, however complicated it is, if such a thing exists, then a syntactic model exists too. Now, what will be super confusing for you guys is that I have been constantly saying, oh, syntax is different from semantics. Syntax is symbols. Semantics is kind of mathematical entities. And where it gets confusing is we can also see syntax as mathematical entities. And in this case, that's exactly what we're going to do. So indeed, <clears throat> our, we are going to make mathematical constructions out of syntactic stuff to make these, if you like, very stupid models that are syntactic but which turn out to be enough. Um, and then you might say, even if you could have these syntactic models, what are they good for? You're not going to put them in a computer, are you? And there is, yes, we do, because that's how Prolog works, actually. So I guess oh, you've not quite had Prolog yet. So Prolog, you work, your actual stuff you compute with is a lot of symbolic things, which are basically uh, these kind of syntactic uh, models, although jazzed up with things like computer integers so that things will run fast. OK, we need to do a construction here. So consider you've got a particular set of clauses for a particular theorem you're trying to prove. So you took your theorem, you negated it, did all this stuff, scolamized it, now you've got clauses. Um, your clauses had better have some constant symbols in them. Now, it is actually possible to come up with a set of clauses that has no constant symbols at all. This can happen, in which case you have to invent one. I would call it A. But usually, there's some constants already. So take the set of all the constants in your clauses, and as I say, throw in one, invent one if you haven't got any constants. Call that set H0. And then at every stage, this looks a lot uglier than it is. At the next stage, take all your function symbols, apply them to all the terms you had at the previous stage, or at any previous stage. Stage after that, again, take all the terms you had before, add to it all of the function symbols you've got, 
apply to all the terms you previously constructed. And what are we going to do in the end? What are we going to get in the end, rather? This so-called Herbrand universe is literally nothing but all the constant terms you can write in your language. So it's actually kind of dumb. In fact, I'll show you how dumb it is. Um, and again, actually, for those of you, maybe when you get to prologue, you'll see you can do some really weird things in prologue, because uh, you can have like terms with minus signs in them and stuff like that. And you can make a term with like a minus zero. Uh, and, and it will be an actual data structure in Prolog. Then you can ask protocol, Prolog, hey, evaluate this thing, and then it will give you a, an actual number out. So this purely syntactic thing is actually even useful in a computer. So we're going to make these syntactic objects, and then our functions on them are going to just stick the function symbol in front of the syntactic object to make a bigger syntactic object. Let me give you a picture now. Again, maybe I should use other visualizer, but I'll do it this way. And I'm going to hide some stuff for a moment. So if we have got if we have got just the constants 0 and 1, if we've got a unary minus and a binary plus, then the Herbrand universe will look like that. And yeah, it looks crazy, right? You've got zero, minus zero, zero plus zero, minus minus zero, and they're all different. Um, now, when, remember, if you want to make a model, it's not enough to have the set of, the, so this is the domain of the value, right? This is the, the, the universe of values that our model's playing with. But now we need functions. What do you think the unary minus function is going to be? The unary minus function will turn 0 into minus 0. It will turn minus 0 into minus minus 0. It will turn 1 into minus 1. It will turn minus 1 into minus minus 1. It's very boring, right? Very stupid, but that's what it is. Equally, the, the interpretation of the plus symbol, the semantics of the plus symbol in this model, will combine, for example, take the two arguments, 0 and 1, and it will return as its result the value 0 plus 1. Isn't that completely insane? Um, So we have now our Herbrand universe, all those terms. We have uh, meanings of our functions, which are just syntactic operations on these syntactic terms. What about the predicates? This is where it gets tricky, and maybe this is the ingenuity of Herbrand. Um, to Basically, oh God, that's unintelligible. The meaning of a predicate is going to be simply some map from these Herbrand terms to 0 or 1. In other words, it's exactly like the meaning of a predicate in general. Remember, the meaning of a predicate in a model, it takes, let's say it has one argument to keep things simple. It's simply a function from your universe, whatever your universe is, into 0 or 1, so telling you whether the thing holds for the predicate or not. Multiple arguments, it takes you know, multiple arguments and returns 0 or 1. Um, the trick here, where it becomes really cool and where it does its thing, is let's suppose your clauses have a natural mathematical model. You can use that natural mathematical model to, if you like, evaluate your predicate and tell you whether it should evaluate to true or not. 
Uh, and that's how you imitate these other models. Now, I think I should go to my slide here with an example. So here are our clauses. I seem to have written them as a prologue program for some reason, but it doesn't matter. They are clauses, however you look at it. So this, so we're, clearly we have one predicate called even. One is not even, two is even. Um, this dot is deliberately not interpreted. It's not, not necessary. It, it could be either plus or times, because if you look at it, this thing is actually true. If I use addition here, it's true. If I use multiplication here, it's also true. So this says if x and y are both even, then x dot y is even. Now, when I make my Hebrand universe, it will be all the terms I can write from 0 and 1 with dots in them. And again, they're all distinct values. 1 dot 1 is distinct from all these other things. And indeed, we have no idea what it should equal because there are, as we told you, two, at least two different models of these clauses, one where the dot is plus, addition, I mean, and another where the dot is multiplication. Um, and then if your, your kind of intuitive interpretation of what these evaluate to will be different, of course, to, if, if dot is addition, of course, that will be different than if dot is multiplication. But what about the interpretation of even? Well, let's suppose dot is, is multiplication. Then, kind of intuitively what you do is you evaluate these things according to, um, according to this model. Oh, I, I overlooked a rather important thing. This so-called Herbrand base, this HB, this Herbrand base, is every combination of things you could write. This is kind of confusing because we never actually use it. So in the Herbrand base is every argument there could be. Well, what's interesting, though, is not this Herbrand base, but rather the actual meaning of the even symbol. When do you want it to be true? What are the true values? Um, now, I guess the point of the Herbrand base is we could get models for, or we could attempt to make models for the clauses using any subset of this and making all of those true. But to get one that will be a model, we, need, we, can, we can do it by basing our selection on a real model. So as I said, if we have multiplication here, we all have a real model of the clauses. If we then use multiplication to decide which of these things in the Herbrand base we want to keep, we end up with this thing here, which says 2 is even. 1 effectively times 2 is even. 2 times 1 is even and so on. That would be the interpretation of even. This will end up satisfying the clauses. If, on the other hand, you said, no, I hate multiplication. It's the most awful mathematical operation. We're going to use addition instead. I don't have it on the slide here, but, but you can see that, for example, 1 plus 2 is not even, and we would not keep it in our interpretation of the even predicate if we based our Herbrand model um, on the addition. So the idea, I mean, the whole point of all this stuff that I said at the beginning is if I have a set of clauses and if I have a real kind of mathematical model of those clauses, however sophisticated it may be, we can obtain from that a purely symbolic model. So when we are interested in the existence of models of a set of clauses, we only need to be concerned with the existence of a purely symbolic model. So that allowed a brand to prove, and I'm going to super simplify this. Okay, a set of clauses is unsatisfiable, meaning it has no models, if and only if it has no models among the Herbrand things. 
Now, one direction is trivial. So it has no models. Clearly, it has no Hebran models either because they're a subset. But in the other direction, if it has no Hebran models, then it has no models of any kind because a Hebran model can imitate any other model. And it turns out, in this case, that you can demonstrate the lack of a model through an explicit contradiction by taking those clauses, replacing the variables in them by basically terms of the Herbrand universe, and making these so-called ground instances. Uh, let me just, because this, this gobbledygook is not very understandable, let me just go through this a bit slower. So if my set of clauses is unsatisfiable, the th theorem tells us, or Brown's theorem tells us, for one thing, the thing that we are looking for is finite, which means it will be computable. It will involve instances of the given clauses. Instances, remember, means plugging in terms for the variables. Now, they are ground. I don't know if I've mentioned ground before. Ground means there are no variables. I don't know why they call them ground. It has nothing to do with dirt. But that's, what they, that's, that's the jargon they use. A ground instance has no variables. So you have now a purely propositional problem at this point. So my example, and I think this came from the example of Yes, this is the exact example that we saw earlier when I said convert something into clauses. You remember about three or four slides back? We arrived at these two clauses. Um, they are unsatisfiable, and an example of Herbrand's theorem is that the following two clauses are already unsatisfiable. And you see this one, this one is an instance of that one, this one is an instance of that one. And because there are no variables left, we can see this as a propositional problem. In other words, instead of, we can see this as a single propositional letter called PFA. So this says PFA, that says not PFA, where again, PFA is regarded as a single letter. And that's the whole reason why these guys put so much work into solving propositional problems. Okay, so this slide, however horrible it may look to you, is what set so many guys, including all those philosophers, trying to find ways of showing sets of clauses to be unsatisfiable. Anyway. Oh dear. Right. Now, we're going to have a brief look at unification. It will be very brief because you're going to get it all again in the prologue course. And I don't think you've had unification already. Um, unification, in its simple form, means I've got two terms. My terms have variables. Can these terms, do these terms have a common instance? That is, is there a way of making these terms identical by plugging in certain terms for the variables in them? Obviously, in a consistent way. So if you've got x in both terms, you plug in the same thing for x. Can, it, can we then make these terms look the same? What's it good for? Well, of course, it's the basis of prologue. You'll get that in another course. Obviously, it's going to be the basis of our theorem proving and other cool stuff. Um, and then there's this language ML. I know you all had to learn a deviant French version last year. I'm not to blame for that. But all of these, every language in this family has, and I hope you could see even in that version, um, the coolness of how the type checking works, and the way you can put in an arbitrary piece of code and in an algorithmic way 
that code can be analyzed and all the various constraints on the type that are implicit in the, nat in the structures that you used in your program just come out and generate for you a most general type. That's a really cool thing. Um, so unification gives us all of those. Now, I just have a few examples. I said you will get it again in Prologue. Ah, and I should actually say, in Prologue, there's a convention in Prologue that the variables are all capital letters. I don't do that because this is more of a logic base. So in, in logic, the variables are the end of the alphabet. So X and its friends are variables. A and B are constants. Um, what did I do here? I'm in the habit of doing that. That's stupid. Let's do it that way. That's how it works. Um, so unification says I've got, let's say, these two terms here, F, X, B, F, A, Y. Can I make them the same? Yes, I can. I can turn them into F, A, B. Any Thunderbirds fans here? Nah, too young can turn them into FAB, provided I replace X by A and B by Y. To do unification, it's quite important that you remember what you did, because in fact, okay, yes, it's nice to know that these are unifiable, but it's essential to know how you did it. Because it will turn out in resolution, in prologue, and in ML type checking, and elsewhere, when you unify two things, generally you will have x's and y's in other places, and they have to be updated as well, in this case with the a and the b. What have we got here? Okay, f, x, x, f, a, b. These are not unifiable, and that's because we can't turn x into a and into b. Now, I remember occasionally seeing on exams or something, someone saying, yes, they're unifiable if A equals B. Well, let me try and put this to you in very simple language. A is not B, ever. <laughs> right? <laughs> Distinct constants. So, no common instance, it fails. Now, this is a cool example. Again, I think there'll be more on it in the prologue course. Maybe you can see intuitively, though, that these terms can't have a common instance. That's because in the first term, all instances of this thing will have arguments, well, they'll have identical arguments. Whereas with this one, all instances, one argument will be bigger than the other. So the attempt to unify this will fail. And basically what would happen here is you would try and say, well, I can set x to y, and then, okay, so this x is really y, then if I could set x to g of y, but that doesn't make sense. You can't set a thing to something that contains itself. Now, in fact, prologue systems often don't do this check. So if you are try a unification like this in prologue, it may, in fact, succeed making a little loop in memory after which probably your program will go into a loop, but it depends. And here is an awful one, a kind of how would you do this one? You can actually unify two terms if you have two fingers. You put one there, you put one there, and you can say, oh, let's replace x by w everywhere. And then here, that will be a w, that's an a, so I have to replace w by a everywhere um, that's a Z. That W is an A, so I have to replace Z by H of A. Um, it's actually quite easy to get into knots if you're trying to do it with two fingers. That's why we have computers. Nevertheless, these are unifiable. It turns out the naive algorithm for unifying can take exponential time in the worst case. Now, as you all know, exponential algorithms are not feasible, and you might wonder how we can get away with this. The fact is, the exponential cases here are pretty rare. However, it is possible, I think you can find online, some quite short 
ML programs that will not get through the compiler, not in the sense that it says you have a type error, but in the sense that you type it in and that's it. Right? It just kind of dies. Because you can you can cause exponential blow up in types and then it just the compiler runs out of memory or something. Okay, so that's enough for us. That gives you a very basic idea of what unification looks like. Okay, now I'm going to show you how we put all these things together to prove some simple theorems. So <clears throat> here's an example. Um, and in case you find this hard to grasp, you could think of R meaning loves. So this says there's somebody that everybody loves. I don't know, Elon Musk? Everybody loves her. Mark Zuckerberg, perhaps. So if there's somebody that everybody loves, then everybody loves somebody, because everybody loves Elon Musk. Okay? So when you look at that, you say, okay, I can believe that. That might be a theorem. Now, what happens when we go through the whole business? We negate it, convert to clauses. I'm going to skip all those steps. These are the clauses we get. Now, the way resolution works, remember, okay, we saw the propositional case. You look for a literal, and you look for the negation of a literal, and they don't match exactly. But now we have unification. So now we have a, an algorithm that can, again, an algorithm that can deterministically choose what to plug in for the variables. It will say x should be B, Y should be A. We'll get a contradiction instantly. It's proved. Okay, this is the converse. And this is not a theorem. So again, if this is about love, so everybody loves somebody, like, I don't know, everybody loves their mother or something like that. So if if everybody loves their mother, does that imply that there is some, I don't know, super mother loved by everybody? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So this is not likely to be a theorem. Let's just see what happens. So turns out when you negate and blah, 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 you get these clauses. They're both unit clauses. Um, the scolarization, it's because the quantifiers were the other way around, we got functions instead of constants from the outcome of the scolarization. And now maybe you can see we're in trouble because for the first instance of R, we want the second argument bigger than the first. Over there, we want the first argument bigger than the second. And indeed, if you try to unify, this will fail. And so... And, and, and this, this thing about where you have a cycle in your, in your variable assignments is called the occurs check. Again, there will be more on this in the prologue course. These are not unifiable. Therefore, there is no explicit contradiction here. So it's not a theorem, and there is no way to prove it. Okay, so that's it for today. Well, thank you.